This challenge will require the wholesale transformation of our carbon-intensive economies. It's a global transition for which we have an estimated price tag. Some have put the global figure between $100 and $150 trillion over the next three decades. At the same time, addressing climate change is the greatest economic opportunity of our time. Well, let's get some reaction to this and speak to Katie Gologli Swan in Glasgow, who is policy coordinator at the Global Development Policy Centre at Boston University. Katie, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, it's a huge bill we're talking about, and no doubt some conflicting attitudes to how that should be paid for. You'll have been listening to all of the various financial leaders speaking today. What's your assessment of their plans? Uh, advanced economies have committed to $100 billion in climate finance for low-income countries by 2020, a commitment that has not yet been met. Um, and so for this $130 trillion, which is, you know, apparently on the table, I think there are big questions about why this $100 billion commitment hasn't been met. Um, this $130 trillion, you know, of, of mobilising private finance, if indeed these pledges are significant, why has that private finance not materialised yet? Why, why has that not delivered the sort of climate action and climate policies and both mitigation and adaptation that countries are needed? So I think that there's a sufficient amount of, of, of scepticism around this figure, um, when in fact what we really needed from advanced economies was to meet that 100 billion commitment and exceed it with a more realistic figure um, in the sort of public investment that is necessary for transition. Uh, you mentioned the scepticism and campaigners are certainly sceptical about the, the attitude that private finance will cover all this, especially given that they will be self-policing. Although Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Richie Sunak, both were hailing it as a, a historic new era. Can you understand the scepticism? Of course. You know, when you look at what private finance flows are going into clean energy and other further climate um, initiatives versus fossil fuels, um, Fossil fuels far outstrip that investment. So I think that it's right for people to be sceptical, particularly around the net zero um, commitment of that. It isn't sufficient if people can be, um, if, if lenders can be a part of GFANS, if they are also going to be investing in coal and fossil fuels, which is the, the, the status of this existing initiative. You know, when it comes to, for example, coal, 87% of the investments in overseas coal is from the private sector, from these same uh, lenders who are going to be a part of GFANS. And so I think that there is right to be scepticism that without more mandatory measures and regulations on these investors, that private finance will actually get into the Paris Agreement alignment. And look, generally, just broadening the conversation out a little bit, I know it's only day four and there's a long way to go, but you've been there for a few days. I know that expectations ahead of the summit were perhaps low, quite low, although seasoned COP observers seem to be quite pleasantly surprised. What was your take on, on it so far? I think that we've still got a ways to go, but there are clearly significant issues emerging. Um, the, the conference has started with the huge disappointment that the 100 billion target has not been met. We really need further commitments. The UNFCCC needs assessment for low-income countries to meet 40% of their Paris commitments is $6 trillion by 2030. UNCTAD puts that for achieving both climate and development commitments at $2.5 trillion. So we really need more finance and we need that, it, that how that finance is mobilised is important. Is that coming in the form of more loans? We, you know, developing countries uh, have increased their, their, their debt by $500 billion in 2020 alone because of the pandemic crisis. And yet we're not seeing a debt in climate initiative at this COP. So these finance questions are, are set central and we're starting off on a bad foot. On top of that, there are huge access questions around this COP. Some countries, particularly those most affected, for example, small islands in the Pacific, haven't been able to come because the commercial flights are not yet 
And so the fact that you know this, some activists are calling this the most exclusionary COP ever. And to start off with that lack of trust on that footing um, undermines that that the the, the process. Um, but we can all hope that in the next few days that negotiations will have an outcome that is is good for everybody, which means you know meeting these commitments. And that's not even to mention the difficulties some people have had getting through the doors. OK, Katie, thank you very much indeed. That's Katie Gallagly-Swan in Glasgow.